Hey, and welcome to the show. Today, I am reading from realprogressives.org. Uh, as you can see, I is capitalist. Capitalism loves fake news. Uh, if you uh, are new to this channel, uh, please subscribe. Uh, and if you haven't, if you haven't subscribed yet to Real Progressives, uh, check them out on YouTube as well. Uh, Steve Grumbine uh, is uh, the, the main the main host of the uh, Real Progressives on YouTube and well, pretty much anywhere else. Anyway, uh, this is uh, an article was done by uh, Byron B I W R R I O N S O N D A H L for those listening. Uh, let's see, as I said, capitalism loves fake news. This was done uh, yesterday, uh, is in the technology and innovation portion of realprogressives.org. Uh, anyway, so let's get on with the story. Uh, it starts off with, but socialists were not born yesterday. They know how to read capitalist newspaper newspapers and to believe exactly the opposite of what they read. Can I read this? <laughs> it seems I'm already having problems. Anyway, uh, the mass media have, in a sense, psychologized many of the people in our country so that they come to desire the controls that are imposed upon them by the capitalist system so they so that they are psychologically at least part of the ruling class by Huey P. Newton, uh, Intercommunalism. Donald Trump was right. This is a shocking statement coming from a Marxist, especially considering the, that Trump is a narcissistic and pathological liar whose presidency remained a tool of the oligarchy and military industrial complex. Nevertheless, he was right when he said that the media are the, quote, fake, fake, disgusting news, unquote, as the saying goes, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Donald Trump was right, but for all the wrong reasons. If he was truly concerned after uh, concerned about fake news, he would not have watched Fox News all day. The real threat from the media comes from their corporate control, but Trump had no problem with this as long as their bias was in his favor. The recent outbreak of war in Ukraine, which actually began in 2014 after the U.S.-backed maiden coup, has put the corporate media into propaganda overdrive. It should not have been so easy to forget the false pretenses of weapons of mass destruction that were used to justify the invasion of Iraq. Don Cohen has exposed the Ukrainian propaganda machine in a piece for Mint Press News entitled Ukraine's Propaganda War, International PR Firms, DC Lobbyists, and CIA Cutouts, he writes. Since the Russian offensive inside Ukraine commenced on February 24th, the Ukrainian military has cultivated the image of a plucky little army standing up to Russian Goliath to bolster the perception of Ukrainian military metal. Kiev has churned out a steady stream of sophisticated propaganda aimed at stirring public and official support from Western countries. The propaganda has featured damn. This is what I meant by read it. Prom prominently, prom preeminently, there we go. In Western media reports, it's not up to, it's obviously not not this uh, author's fault, it's my own fault as far as the reading part goes. Anyway, in Western media reports, without any verification, CNN reported in quotes, all 13 Ukrainian defenders were killed in a Russian bombardment Thursday. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, said, and quotes, CNN continued, all border guards died heroically but did not give up. They will be awarded the title of hero of Ukrainian posthumously, posthumously, Zelensky said. Later, they were forced to update the report with the following. Update, Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island were all feared to have been killed in the Russian attack on February 24th. 
on February 28th. However, the Ukrainian Navy released a statement saying that troops were alive and well, but were forced to surrender due to a lack of ammunition. It turns out that using President Zelensky as their only source for this information was a bad idea. The tale of the Snake Island defenders' brave last stand made the great propaganda, even though it was a complete fabrication. On February 28th, NBC Nightly News reported on the use of cluster munitions in Ukraine. Now, I always thought that was uh, maybe cluster uh, uh, ammunition. Anyway, still, the U.S. hasn't used them since the first Gulf War, even over 30 years ago. This is inaccurate, as FAIR.org reports. The last reported U.S. use of cluster munitions were, was against Yemen in 2009. 13 years ago is nowhere close to 30 years ago, and they were used multiple times between uh, the Gulf War and Yemen as well. In fact, according to Human Rights Watch, Ukraine used a cluster of munitions in Donetsk City in 2014, but this was left out of NBC's report. War crimes are only important when they serve the corporate narrative, otherwise they can be ignored. The Independent captioned a video missiles hit Ukraine's biggest nuclear plant starting major fires, in quotes. But the actual article declared, in quotes, in the statement of the state energy service officials said that a fire at Zabarizka, Zabar, Zapar, uh, is a uh, nuclear power uh, station broke out in training in a training building outside the plant's per- per- perimeter. NBC's uh, NBC News entitled "Footage of the Same Event: a Nuclear Power uh, Nuclear Plant, Excuse Me, in Ukraine on Fire After Russia Shells Facility." It quotes. CNN captured their reporting on the piece, and uh, CNN's seen on video footage, though for some time it was unclear where the fire was or the scale of the threat posed to the facility, and in the same article, CNN could not immediately verify any details of the, fi- of the firefight on the territory of the plant. This breaking news turned out to be a non-story as the fire was actually outside the perimeter of the power plant, yet the major news networks could not resist the temptation to sens- 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 sensationalize it. Among the Western media, that agenda involves pushing the U.S. and NATO narrative that the attack on Ukraine was unprovoked and ignoring the neo-Nazi presence within Ukraine. However, uh, learned and, uh, having learned nothing from the Iraq war, the media brings on the same pundits who pushed for war and reported on NWMDs, then and then, uh, then, and then Senator Joe Biden was at the forefront of the push for war in Iraq. Can the public really be this naive and keep falling from the same narratives from the same sources? Uh, John Pilger, uh, quote, the United States has constitutionally, I guess constitutionally, uh, the the first uh, press on earth. Okay. Uh, Yet in practice, it has a media obsequious to the formulas and deceptions of power. This is why the U.S. was effectively given media approval to invade Iraq and Libya and Syria and dozens of other countries. I apologize if I messed up any of those words. I tried. I probably failed. (laughs) But anyway, just want to let you guys know that. Anyway, so in a recent article, NBC's News has admitted that the Biden administration is releasing fake news as part of a propaganda war. It was an attention-grabbing assertion that made headlines around the world. U.S. officials have said that they had indications suggesting Russia might be preparing to use chemical agents in Ukraine. President Joe Biden later said publicly that, but three U.S. officials told NBC News this week there is no evidence Russia has brought 
any chemical weapons near Ukraine. They said the U.S. released information to deter Russia from using the banned uh, munitions. This is the government admitting that they are lying, and the media are cooperating with those lies. From this dystopia viewpoint, lying to the public in order to get ahead of Russia is a perfectly acceptable strategy, given that this country went to war over phantom weapons of mass destruction. Their willingness to deceive is no longer shocking. It is only a surprise that they are so open about it. The U.S. public should be outraged by these blatant falsehoods, but appear to have fully bought into this narrative. Where are the anti-war protests? Democrats have once again killed the anti-war movement. The propaganda is not limited to the Ukraine war, it, Ukrainian war. It has been ongoing. In just one recent example, the New York Times published a piece in March entitled American Soldiers Help Mazibik Battle an Expanding ISIS Affiliate. The first paragraph notes the insurance, not the insurance, insurgents near some of the world's biggest gas reserves has killed at least 2,000 civilians and displaced another 670,000. It does not take it, it does not take on in, in a depth uh, uh, knowledge of the U.S. foreign policy to see the connection. Uh, uh, see the connection between massive gas reserves and the deployment of U.S. troops. Yet the article does not make this connection. And this journalist, or is this journalism, or is this propaganda? Why isn't the importance of the Nord Stream two pipeline mentioned? Every time Ukraine is in the news, U.S. troops are stationed in oil fields in Syria. Yet this isn't mentioned when they are when they are drone strikes in the area. Or are are drone strikes in the area? The corporate media lies about omission when they fa failed to, to mention they these key points. The connection between the U.S. military and climate change is also largely ignored when they report when they report on war. This is from David Sirota, which, okay, uh, dear media, find any people, find any people to be your national security expert pundits other than the handful of people who lied America into uh, Iraq war. Literally any people or any human beings on the planet other than them. Thanks. Sincerely yours, every non-sociopath. While, other, while there are significant differences in reporting between outlets and major media staunchly defending capitalism, the imperialism and Jeff and imperialism, excuse me, Jeff Bezos did not buy the Washington Post and simply let it be. He bought the Washington Post because he under, he understood the power the media plays in public opinion. It is no coincidence that the Washington Post published 16 negative stores, stories about Bernie Sanders in 16 hours of 2016. While the Post claims that Jeff Bezos allows our newsroom to operate with, it, with full independence as our reporters and editors can't attest, the coverage indicates otherwise. Six corporations now control 90% of the media. Perhaps the most, perhaps the best illustration of the impact of this corporate corporate dominance was when Sinclair Broadcast Group required local anchors who require, oh sorry, record promos where they denounced the troubled trend of irresponsible one-sided news stories plaguing our country and say that one members, uh, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. News anchors across the country recited the exact same lines as ordered by their corporate masters. Mainstream media is a propaganda machine uh, indoctrinating the masses with a corporatist agenda. The press is not free as long as it is privately owned and being run for profit. The, we herald and cherish the notion of free press in this country, but what does that really mean? If we have this ever-constrictive media apparatus that essentially only echoes corporate media talking points 
I mean, this is an apparatus that is controlled by five corporations. It affects more than 90% of everything we see, hear, and read. That was from Abby Martin. The revolutionists have how PBS portrayed the legacy of uh, Eugene V. Debs. The working class can expect nothing from the press of the capitalist class but misrepresentation and injustice in the struggle for its rights. The working class must build up a powerful press of its own, and this vital fact it cannot realize too soon. Eugene V. Deb, Debs. This corporate deception is not limited to newspapers and television programs. In 1979, Michael Parenti interviewed Bernie Bernard Sanders, who said this. I did a documentary film about the American socialist Eugene Debs. It depicted his role in the labor movement and his opposition to, the, to big business in this country. Every TV station I brought it to rejected the film on the grounds that it wasn't objective. It didn't show both sides. I gathered and they... Wanted a, pl a plug for capitalism. Can you imagine if I had done a film celebrating the accomplishments of John D. Rockefeller or Harry For uh, Harry Henry Ford? Those stations would never have insisted on hearing the socialist side. They would have never complained about a lack of objectivity. Uh, inventing reality, the politics, and the mass media. Uh, Parenti, 1986. It is, it is likely it was not rejected for being too biased, but rather because it was too radical. One-sided documentaries are published all the time, as can be seen with Netflix recent YouTube release of Winter on Fire, which is, one, which is a one-sided propaganda piece that ignores the presence of neo-Nazis at the Maiden Coop. Bernie could not find a TV station to air his documentary, but is now available online. There is now a full documentary on Eugene V. Debs entitled The Revolutionist, Eugene V. Debs. It was first aired in October 2019. This documentary, the documentary, excuse me, was made possible by corporate sponsors, including um, ML Gamada Bank and Unico Capital and then in the, into the jail cell and left that, that with him. Okay. And Debs spent the time reading this, and this opened his eyes. Not everybody thinks that actually happened. Things that actually happened. He was really not as interested in Karl Marx or in Eugene theory about socialism as he was about socialism as a political tradition in the American strains or strain. This is a misleading and revisionist statement Debs himself wrote about the very event which the PBS documentary claims might have not happened. The Chicago jail sentences were, yeah, sentences were followed by six months of Woodstock, and it was here that socialism gradually laid a hold of me in its own uh, responsible fashion. Books and pamphlets and letters from socialists came by every mail, and I began to read and think and dissect the autonomy of the system, or anatomy, there we go, uh, of the system, and which workmen, uh, working men, however organized, could be shattered and battered and splintered at a single stroke. The winter, the, the writings of uh, Bellamy and Blatt and Blanchford early appealed to me. The cooperative Commonwealth of Groenland also impre impressed me, but the writings of Kotsky were so clear and conclusive that I readily grasped nearly, uh, not merely his argument, but also caught the spirit of his socialist utterance. And I thank him, and I thank him, and all who helped me out of darkness into light. It was at this time when the first glimmerings of socialism were beginning to penetrate that Victor Alberger and I have loved him ever since come to Woodstock as if a providential preven, preven, instrument and delivered the first impassioned message of socialism I had ever heard, the very first to set the wires uh, humming in my system as a souvenir of what visit, uh, that visit 
There is in my library a volume of Capital by Karl Marx, inscribed with the compliments of Victor L. Berger, which I cherish as a token of priceless value. The same event is also referred to in Deb's obituary in the following manner. And quotes, later, Mr. Debs defied an injunction, and that is why he found himself at Woodstock. One day, he had a visitor, a socialist, Victor L. Berger. The visitor left him an uh, unimportant-looking little book. Uh, prisoner Debs read it slowly, eagerly uh, revenous. The book was, was Karl Marx, Marx's Das Kapital uh, in the brain of pr uh, Prisoner Debs. There began to simmer a moral militant type of socialism for the U.S. than the mere reading of utopian books. Debs also indirectly referred to this uh, episode in a speech at Chicago in 1912, where he said, in quotes, 18 years ago, uh, in this great city of Chicago, there was a great industrial battle between the railroad employee employees and the combined railroad corporations. The victory was within our grasp when the federal courts intervened and snatched victory from our hands. They threw me in jail. That's where I studied socialism and when I began or became a socialist. The workers of the city are beginning to realize that capitalism is doomed. Here are two primary sources confirmed that Debs did in fact receive and read capital while in prison at, Woods, or at Woodstock uh, and the third source, which does not name capital, but also refers to the same event, yet the PBS documentary goes against the evidence and tries to rewrite Debs as a socialist in the American strain. And viewers are supposed to trust this is not a biased viewpoint. Anyone familiar with Deb's writings can see the profound impact that Marx had on his life. The only mention of the Bolsheviks and the revolutionists is in a negative light. It simply ignores that Debs wrote in February of 2019, excuse me, 1919, from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, I am a Bolshevik and proud of it. The documentary portrayed Debs as a tepid performer rather than the Marxist revolutionary he truly was. Bernie's untitled documentary presents an entirely different picture from the PBS work. It starts by challenging the media, he explains. In quotes, why haven't they told you about Gene Debs and the ideas he fought for? The answer is simple. More than a half a century after his death, a handful of people who own and control this country, including the mass media and the educational system, still regard Debs and his ideas as dangerous, as a threat to their stability and class rule. And as someone best, uh, as someone best forgotten about, Bernie also refers directly to capital being smuggled into Debs during his stay in the prison as a true event. The capitalist system he called out directly by Bernie while revolutionists skirt around the issue. The difference between these two documentaries striking was, oh, I'm sorry, one was aired, one was not. The contrast between the two films illustrates a systemic problem. Problem. The corporate strang stranglehold on the media funding can be uh, found for a for a, a less radical documentary, but no one wants to touch Bernie's, even though it was a more accurate portrayal of Debs. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the removal of capitalism from journalism. The problem with the media has been covered repeatedly, but it is only growing worse. Michael Parenti wrote about, a, about it in event, Eventing Reality. And two years later, Noam Chomsky released Manufacturing Consent. Mantaibi expanded on this in The Hate Inc., exposing how the media creates a artificial rift in the working class, today it is not groundbreaking to point out that media is a problem. 
Yet despite these excellent works exposing the issue, nothing has improved. The corporate narrative is more entrenched than ever. The press is also powerful in its image making role. It can make a criminal look like he's the victim and make the victim like, look like he's the criminal. This is the press, an irresponsible press. It will make the criminal look like he's the victim and make the victim look like he's the criminal. If you aren't careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Malcolm X, 1964. Today, Facebook puts warnings on media outlets that are wholly or partially under the editorial control of their government, but does not warn people about corporate controlled media. Twitter also warns of state affiliated media. State owned media is no more dangerous than corporate media, yet, social media sites, no, sites put warning labels on the former. State media should be a giant step forward if done properly. As the FCC already oversees the airwaves and networks, nationalizing the media would not be too difficult a task. <coughs> State ownership of the productive forces is not the solution of the conflict, but concealed when it are the technical conditions that form the elements of that solution, Frederick Ingalls. Another potential solution is that the press writers, journalists, and other content creators could be included under the auspices of auspicious of a federal jobs guarantee. This uh, would roven, remove, I'm sorry, uh, would remove the need for corporate funding and sponsorship as the media would be entirely funded by the state. A FJ, uh, FJG moves up towards the communist concepts of for from each according according to their ability to each according to their need. This would detach the press from corporate uh, control and allow journalists uh, more freedom as they would be guaranteed a paycheck from the state for their work. It would also eliminate unemployment and improve the material conditions of the working class as Pavlina R. Chernava has described. In her book, A Job Guarantee, uh, the case four, uh, I guess you can get that anywhere like Amazon or other places like that. Anyway, uh, let's see, the job guarantee JP, JG uh, is a public option for jobs. It is a permanent, federally funded, and a locally administered program that supplies voluntar voluntary employment opportunities on demand for all who are ready and willing to work on a living wage. While it is first and foremost a jobs guarantee, it has the potential to be transformative by advancing the public purpose and improving working conditions, people's everyday lives, and the economy as a whole. Since the jobs are federally funded and locally sourced, a FJG could revive local journalists, which is dying in the current economy, according to the Brookings Institute, over 65 million Americans live in, in, in countries with one uh, with only one local newspaper or none at all, where citizens used to receive their news from local sources, uh, they now rely more and more on corporate mega news organizations by putting control of the news back in the hands of the, uh, the community, the FJG would be a, a huge step forward for oppressed freedom. Rachel Maddow does not have her job due to great journalism, but rather because she does not challenge the establishment's narrative. A recent court ruling found that her show does not represent objective facts. Meadow does not keep her political views a secret and therefore audiences could expect her to use objective language that comforts, comforts with her political opinions. Thus, Meadow's show is different than a typical news segment with, where anchors inform viewers about the daily news. The point of Meadow's show is for her to provide 
the news, but also to offer her opinion as to as to that news. Therefore, the court finds that the media medium of the alleged defamation statement made or makes it more likely that a reasonable viewer would would not conclude that the contest 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 statement complies as assertion of objective facts. So in other words, they're saying that the viewer should be responsible enough to know what is opinion and what is news. When you combine the two, um, and, and they, I think they call it entertainment. I call it BS, but whatever. Uh, until the capital prof, uh, profit motive and agendas are removed from the, new, from the press, it will not be free. In the 2021 uh, World Press Freedom Index, the United States comes in 44th of the of out of 180 countries there is much room for improvement write as you speak and speak as you write our primary school teachers taught us later what we are told is say what say what has been uh, prescribed for you and write what you repeat after others Karl Marx and uh, this is an important distinction. A capitalist media seeks profit and control rather than truth. This goes as far as the president of the United States, who is instructed who to call on in press conferences. Much of what the public sees is simply elaborate theater presented by the ruling class. Okay, so this is mysteriously unnamed. Like a reality show, everything is scripted. Biden, ladies and gentlemen, they gave me a list here. The first person that was instructed instructed to call upon Kelly O'Donnell of NBC. Oops, a little too much information. This is not freedom of the press. This is a carefully scripted narrative that is being controlled by money to interest. What would be the press look like under? I'm sorry. What would the press look like under communism? Lenin explained at the Communist International in 1919. Genuine, genuine freedom and equality will be embodied in the system which the communists are building, and which is where will be no opportunity, and and in which there will be no opportunity for ma for massive wealth at the expense of others, no uh, objective opportunities for putting the press under the direct or indirect power of money, and no uh, impediments in the way of any working man, or groups of working men and. Any numbers for enjoying and, pr pr and practicing equal rights in the use of public printing presses and public stocks of paper. Uh, okay, see, so the press would not be tied to private corporations' influence, but would truly be free. No longer would journalists like Emily Wilder be fired for her tweets in solidarity with the Palestinian people. While the Associated Press fired her for what they called a clear bias, Rachel Maddow retained her job with the expectation and acceptance of her bias. There is a clear double standard here. In order to free the press, the capitalist system of private ownership must be addressed, as Andre Breton and Diago Rivera wrote. The first thing to do to win real equality and genuine democracy for the working people for the workers and peasants is to deprive capital of possibility of hiring writers, buying up published, uh, buying up published houses, and hiring the newspaper. Newspapers, excuse me. And to do that, the capitalists and exploiters have to be overthrown and their resistance and suppressed. The capitalists have always used the term freedom to mean freedom for the rich to get richer and for the workers to starve to death. It uh, in the capitalist usage, freedom of the press means freedom of the rich to bribe the press, of freedom to use the wealth to shape and fabricate a so called public opinion. The closing down of RT America was a huge loss to independent journalists. Twitter's largest uh, stockholder is now Elon Musk. Facebook is blocking RT and Sputnik News in the European Union. Facebook is also uh, blocking independent investigative journalists out, outlet consortium news for going against their community standards. The propaganda war is more intense than ever and the working class is losing millions of people. Are, uh, middle class is losing millions of people are getting their news entirely from corporate mouthpieces. Oh, 
great piece. Uh, just starting to get to know these guys. Um, for more information, I would just go to realprogressives.org. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm sorry if I got a lot of the words wrong in regards to pronunciation, but uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of great detail. Um, this gentleman did a great, a great job in what he did, and yeah, I have nothing but uh, admiration for what he did. Uh, anyway, I'd like to thank you guys for watching, for listening. Um, support realprogressives.org. I uh, visited a Patreon. I'm not sure how to let's see if I can. Anyway, yeah, uh, I'll put that uh, in the section below. Um, this will be on my YouTube channel. So subscribe here, subscribe to uh, Will Progressives. And uh, I'd like to thank them for allowing me to uh, read this uh, and to give Byron Sund Sundal, I'm not, I'm not going to try to pronounce it in the future. Uh, my tongue cannot go that way. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching either way. And more content will be coming up later on for my Substack and for my Patreon. Peace out for now.